I think it's time to to start. It's one minute past ten, so I will start this webinar now. Okay, let's see. So, hi again, good morning. Welcome to NDI's first online event this year on the Spatial Transcriptomics 10X Vision technology. Uh, so we have a few more events to follow this spring and the fall, and um, uh, that will uh, come later. So my name is Michaela Asp, and I'm a project coordinator at the National Genomics Infrastructure here at SciLife Lab. Uh, and I will be your moderator during this morning's webinar. And I also have my colleague Renuka here with me today, who is also project coordinator at NDI, and she will operate this webinar in the background. So this webinar will be recorded and published on our YouTube channel, uh, with the exception of a few talks that include uh, unpublished data. So as you can see in the agenda to the right, the schedule is packed with interesting talks, ending with a Q&A session where you can ask our panel of speaker any questions you have about the technology and about what we at NGI can offer you as a service. So questions can be sent in throughout the whole session, but will be answered later on. And you find all the approximate time slots for each speaker's talk. Um, and you can send in questions uh, by the Q and A um, chat or raising your hand button if you prefer to ask it yourself, and you can see these buttons in the bottom of the Zoom window. So with that, I will start off this seminar by giving you an introduction to NGI and to spatial transcriptomics. So who are we at the National Genomics Infrastructure? So SciLife Lab hosts almost two hundred research groups, ten platforms, and forty units. And NDI is part of the genomics platform, and we are the largest unit at SciLife Lab, both in terms of the number of projects and the number of users. So we are a national research infrastructure and are physically located uh, at uh, three places, which is Stockholm, Uppsala, Uppsala Genome Center, and Uppsala Snip and Seek Technology Platform. So the Stockholm site and the Snip and Seek platform primarily use Illumina technology while the Uppsala Genome Center focus on other technologies, such as PacBio and the ION technology. At NGI, we provide access to technologies for massively parallel sequencing and genotyping at all scales, and associated bioinformatics support to uh, researchers uh, based in Sweden, and, but also for researchers outside Sweden. We offer several types of library prep and sequencing methods, uh, where one of them is the 10x Visium technology that we will be focusing on during this webinar. So just to get a hint uh, on our capacity. So last year, we processed over 1,000 projects containing more than 60,000 samples. So this generated in total 765 terabase pairs, which is approximately equivalent to producing 1x coverage of a human genome every second minute. So please have a look at our website to find out more on different library preparation options or sequencing uh, options um, that we provide, uh, as well as some price information. So you find us at ngisweden.scilifelab.se. You can also follow us on social media, Twitter, YouTube, and now also for our younger audience in the general public and the future of our scientific community, Instagram. I would like to briefly mention that there is a new platform under development at SciLife Lab, where all spatial and single cell technologies will be collected. So NDI will be part of two of its units, uh, the spatial transcriptomics unit, along with one of the single cell sequencing units. And the aim of this platform is to provide service on several types of spatial technologies in combination with single cell analysis. So if you're interested in a spatial multiomics approach for your samples, uh, please get in touch with me, Michaela Asp, 
or Charlotte Stadler to discuss more. And you find our contact information uh, down to the left. So more on spatial omics can be found uh, at our SciLife Lab website, scilifelab.se slash facilities slash spatial omics. So what questions can spatial biology help us to answer? So many of you have already seen this smooth uh, fruit smoothie analogy before, uh, where each analysis approach is compared by using fruits. So with bulk, we are able to see many things across um, many sample types, but details about the compositions are lost, much like the components in a well-blended smoothie. So we can use single cell technologies to tease apart and to identify these components and to understand what individual cell types are there. But we still lack insight in how these tissues are put together and how cell types interact with each other. So with spatial technologies, we are able to investigate how tissues are structured, much as depicted here in the fruitcake, where you can see how strawberries lie next to the kiwis and the blueberries, etc. So spatial analysis allows us to see the cells in the context of in its environment, which is needed to draw more relevant biological conclusions. So this was highlighted when Nature Method declared spatial result transcriptomics as method of the year. And in order for a method to be nominated as method of the year, the method has to fundamentally impact and dramatically advance the way scientists explore questions otherwise unanswerable. And the maintenance of spatial context is crucial for understanding key aspects of cell biology, developmental biology, neurobiology, tumor biology, and much more. So if we look back on the historical timeline of spatial result transcriptomics technologies, we can definitely see an acceleration of published method just within the last two to three years. And although this particular review came out just a year ago, a number of new methods have already entered the scene, uh, which shows how quickly this field is expanding. So at NGI, we offer spatially resolved RNA sequencing through the 10x Visio method as a service. And for you, those of you who don't know, this is a product that has actually emerged from uh, a technology called spatial transcriptomics developed here at SciLife Lab. So I thought it would be nice also to show you what the timeline, uh, timeline of that looks like. So it all began an evening during late fall 2009, when Jonas Frisén contacted Joachim Lundeberg about an idea of how to do unbiased RNA analysis in individual neurons in the brain and the development of the technology that was termed spatial transcriptomics started early 2010. Three years later, the first results was published at ADBT for the very first time and the term digital pathology was coined, meaning that hematoxylin and eosine staining and gene expression analysis could be performed on the same tissue. 2015, the research group had expanded to almost triple its previous size. And finally, in 2016, the method was published in science. And at the end of 2018, the technology was acquired and further developed by the 10x genomics company under the name 10x Visium. So after the first science publication came out, many papers have followed uh, and applying the method to several species and a number of different organs. Here we're just showing a few of them, uh, but examples of these are human and mouse brain, heart, spinal cord, intestine, breast and prostate tumor, rheumatoid arthritis, melanoma, pancreas, and much, much more. So with that, I would like to hand over to Anneli Molbrink, who has many years of experience with this technology and is now a technical expert at NGI. And she will go through the 10X Visium workflow and the service that we provide at NGI. So, hi everyone, good morning. 
I hope you are well in the sunshine. Lovely April weather. So I will talk about the 10x Visium Spatial Gene Expression solution, solution, a fantastic method that combines histology and global mRNA expression in the spatial context. I might be a bit biased by saying that it is fantastic since I have been working with this for seven years and being a part of the development of the method and now also being a part of implementing this method as a service for you at NGI. Uh, a very common question that we get here is uh, the sample requirements. So as for now, we take in fresh frozen OCT embedded tissue where the freezing uh, procedure being a very important part of it. And this is something that we discuss with each user. Um, the RNA quality has also to be high with a RIN value at least seven. And this is something that we ask the user to check before they hand in the samples. We want the morpho morphology to have a high quality. And this is also checked by the user by taking some sections, stain them with hematoxylin and eosine, and check in the microscope how it looks like. We can help out with evaluating these images uh, in order to, to see if they look suitable for this method. The tissue has to be, uh, uh, has high uh, integrity and uh, no cracks and so on and so forth. The sample size cannot be bigger than six times six millimeters. And you will see later on why that is. Uh, there is a whole variety of compatible mammal tissue so far that is supported by 10X, meaning that it has been evaluated by them. Uh, however, we have taken in other samples, uh, other tissue types, still mammals, like skin, for instance, we have done uh, several projects on with, uh, in our hands, good results. So we can always discuss your samples, even though they are not on this list. This list can be found on the next web page. Um, However, however, we are not taking in plant tissue as for now. The Visium method can be um, uh, used in many research areas and applications, but we want you to have a scientific question with a broad spatial component, as this is a, a global unbiased method. Uh, you will get out a lot of data and you will see in the end the prices of it. It's fairly expensive. So if you are just interested in a few genes, we can, we can um, point you in the right direction to what method to use. So I will talk about uh, the Visium array that looks like this. It, can, it is a regular glass array. Uh, with four identical capture areas. Each and every area is printed with capture probes and it has 5,000 spots per area. And the spot size is five, 55 micrometers in diameter. And as I said, this is an unbiased method. So it will capture all, uh, all transcripts that have a poly A tail or, or poly A stretch. The cell resolution is one to 10 cells per spot, depending on the cell size. Um, and that depends, of course, on the tissue type and the thickness also. So, nota bene that this uh, method is not single cell of single cell resolution. The array in more detail here, I wanted to show you the the probe, or we can call it primer, uh, that is printed on top. Uh, in magnification here, you can see the different spots and they have different colors representing spe a specific spatial barcode. That is simply an X and Y coordinate that will be um, 
uh, enables us to map back from where the transcript derived uh, when we do the data analysis. It also has a unique molecular identifier, which enables us to remove uh, PCR-induced uh, duplicates. And then we have a poly T stretch and a little stretch in the end that anchors into the gene. Uh, the workflow, in short, looks like this. We section uh, with a cryostat. It is extremely important to keep the sample cold, of course, all of the time to keep the RNA uh, fresh and not being broken down. We place one section each per each uh, capture area. Then we fix the tissue in cold methanol. And then we stain it and we take bright field images at 20 times magnification. We go on then uh, with permeabilization. And then we do cDNA synthesis on top of the array. We do a template switch and we have single stranded <clears throat> DNA that we cleave off and we uh, collect it into individual tubes do a cDNA amplification, and then we do library construction, we sequence, and then we can an analyze the data. This part will be covered after me by Ludwig and Remy. <clears throat> so one critical part, really critical, of this uh, method is the sectioning. And all of you that have tried sectioning knows that this is not trivial. You have to be trained, you have to be skilled, and you have to have the sectioning gods with you because there are many enemies uh, out there. There can be cracks, there can be folds, there can be electrostatic forces. And uh, sometimes you just simply uh, uh, close down the cryostat and you go away and you do it the next day because nothing works. Um, we section most of the tissue in uh, the size of 10 micrometers. Uh, once the section is here, we flatten it out. I usually flip it upside down also. It's very uh, crucial, of course, that you don't touch uh, the actual sample in the middle here with the brushes. Then you warm the glass light a little bit. The glass light is always kept in the cryostat, but you have to warm this little area a little bit with your finger. And then you can uh, slowly go with a glass towards the, the sample that is here. And then it sort of goes up and attaches to the glass. You warm it a little bit to, to make it adhere to the glass surface. Uh, we usually do the sectioning one day and then we put the, the, the arrays in the minus 80 freezer and the next day uh, you move on uh, with the fixation first and when you have done the fixation and staining uh, procedure, you uh, mount your glass light in this cassette so you can pipette individually to each sample, keep them divided. I will not go through what we are doing the first day in, in very much detail. This can be, um, all of these pictures can be found on Tenex website in the user guides. So if you're interested in exactly what is going on, you can go in there and read more. You can also ask if there is something specific that you would like to know. Uh, the tissue permeabilization that we do in the beginning has been established before uh, on another type of slide that I'm not showing here today. Um, uh, but we do that uh, because each tissue types may require different, different time of uh, permeabilization. Most of the tissues that I have been working with, uh, with a Visium protocol uh, gets um, a permeabilization time of 15 minutes, with some exceptions. But we still need to perform this on each tissue type. We don't need to do it on all your tissues or your samples, but on one representative one, at least. So we are doing 
some things here. Uh, <laughs> a lot of pipetting on and off and cleaning of the wells. And then we, as I said, we cleave it off and we have single stranded DNA here that goes over to tubes. And then we do the cDNA amplification. And here after that, we also have a bioanalyzer checkup for the quality and to see if uh, we have what we want to have. And then this is performed during one day, what I talked about now. And then we do the library construction that takes yet another day. We use dual index and we do some fragmentation and some uh, end repair a tailing and clean up priming. And then we index the samples. And then we quantify the libraries uh, and then we check the quality and the average length of them on a bioanalyzer. We pull the samples and then we sequence them. And here I wanted to show um, representative bioanalyzer trace from one of our projects that we have run. And this is actually a skin sample. And as you can see, the library, if you know how a library should look like, this looks more or less perfect. So, and we also got out good data from this project. Um, so the sequencing requirement then, the read, uh, the setup that we use is the spatial, the read one consists of, uh, uh, I'm not a, a sequencing expert, so I will just mention this very briefly. Spatial barcode and UMI has 28 bases, and then you can see we have dual index here, 10 bases each, and then read to consist of 90 bases. And 10x recommends 50,000 read pairs per spot covered with tissue, meaning that depending on the size of your tissue, we do a calculation how to sequence this. The bigger uh, tissue you have, the more, the more you have to sequence, so to speak. Uh, so uh, here you can see, uh, I would say that the best of worlds is that, that you cover as much as possible because the cost of array is higher than the actual sequencing. Here you can see an example of very small tissues. These are biopsies of some kind and they have embedded them in parallel here. That is also something you can do to uh, get out more of the array as long as you know what you have in each one, maybe not blend all types of uh, controls and, and, and uh, samples in the same one, but you can multi, multiply your samples here. It is a bit tricky to embed, but it, it, it works actually. Uh, so this is my last slide and I want to mention the costs and some of you may get the coffee in the in your throat now because this is it is a very expensive method but you will get out a lot a lot of information but uh, since it is so expensive we want you to have the highest quality that that's why we want to emphasize this upstream um, things that you do with the freezing and embedding and everything so that everything is perfect before you start then you will get out good data so the tissue optimization experiment cost 10,000. Uh, the tissue uh, optimization is done on another slide, another type of slide. Uh, it has uh, just a smear of probes. There, there is no spatial barcode, no UMIs or, or so, just a capture probe. And then we have... Um, then we introduce uh, fluorescent nucleotides to the cDNA synthesis. And after we have done that uh, on top of the array, we cleave off the tissue and then we can see the cDNA footprint. And it should resemble exactly how the, the tissue looked like before. Uh, if we permeabilize too much, there will be lateral diffusion. 
if we permeabilize too little, uh, it will be dark and you will not get out as much as possible. So we do it to find the sweet spot. So we do a time series of like 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes. That uh, array has also eight capture areas. So we have some space there to, to, to uh, uh, play with. Then the actual library prep slide cost 53,000. And uh, now you understand why I said that it is good if you can uh, fill it up as much as possible. And that includes a library prep of four tissue sections. This price is not only for the slide, it is also for the whole procedure, the, the library prep. And then we come to the sequencing. And as I said before, uh, we calculate this depending on the size of your tissue. And this example shows for four sections covering 50% of the spots, uh, 500 million reads are recommended. And then we can use uh, Novasec SP200 flow cell. And this costs 32,000 Swedish crowns. So the total cost will be 95,000 for four tissue sections. And um, uh, for projects containing more samples, we can also offer a single lane of uh, the Illumina Novasec S4. Uh, and this takes down the price per base. So, so with that said, the pictures that I had in my presentation, I took from 10X website with, after I talked to them that that was okay. And uh, I hope that I have given you some information that will be beneficial for you. And you can always come back with your questions and uh, have a nice day. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Anneli, for your talk. So next we have Ludwig Larsson and uh, Remy Olsen, who are both uh, bioinformaticians. So Ludwig Larsson is a bioinformatician in the Spatial Research Group, and, and Remy is a bioinformatician at NGI, and both of them have a lot of experience in using different um, several types of bioinformatics tools. And they will talk today and uh, give you an overview, a general overview on how spatial transcriptomics data can be analyzed and uh, what type of primarily, uh, primary analysis that we can offer here at NGI. Okay, so I would like to start to thank you, Michaela, for inviting me to this uh, webinar. Um, yes, as you said, I'm a PhD student and a bioinformatician in the genomics research group at Celef Lab. And I have been working with the data analysis of issue data for the last couple of years. So I hope to give you some kind of um, idea of what you can use this type of data for. So I would like to start um, to show you this uh, to give you, give you some kind of intuition for what the Visium data, data set looks like. So first of all, you have this bright field image of a hematoxylin and eosinstein tissue section. Um, this one in particular is from a small intestine biopsy. Uh, and I think this is a very important part of the data set because here you have access to um, detailed morphological information in very high resolution. And then the other part of the data set is this uh, gene expression matrix. So here I have highlighted these little black circles on the tissue section, and those represent the, the spots where we capture mRNA. And as you can see, they, are, um, they cover a few cells. So each spot represents an average expression of a mixture of cells. And I think this is really important to keep in mind. So just to show you a couple of examples, this is a tissue type that is very heterogeneous. So you will find areas where you have quite low cell densities, 
For example, here you have a, on the top left corner, you have this blood vessel surrounded by connective tissue. Here you can clearly see that some spots only cover maybe one or two cells. And the same thing for the muscle tissue. You have a quite low cell density per spot. Uh, but then if you look into other parts of the tissue, you have very high cell count. And this is usually also reflected in the number of genes that you get per spot and the number of uh, uh, transcripts that you capture. Uh, so when you have performed a Visium experiment, you will have raw sequencing data from uh, the Illumina machine, for example. And then you need to process this data uh, into, uh, to get this gene expression matrix that you can work with. And you can do this using either the Space Ranger pipeline from 10x Genomics or the Spatial Transcriptomics pipeline from our lab. If you run Space Ranger, you will get this really nice uh, report uh, shown here to the right. And I think for those, those of you who have used uh, Cell Ranger for single cell uh, RNA-seq data analysis, you're probably familiar with this. So here you get some uh, useful quality metrics telling you how well the sequencing went, the mapping to the reference genome. And you also get this um, quality metrics telling you how many genes you have per spot and how many uh, transcripts you have per spot. So this can be very useful to assess the quality of your uh, sample. And this report also, it will also flag if something looks really off. For example, if you have very few reads mapping to the reference genome, it will flag this for you and tell you that something looks uh, strange. Uh, then there's also uh, an analysis tab in this report. I think this is quite useful as a sanity check. Uh, so what you get here is some very basic uh, analysis results. You get this spatial visualization of uh, transcripts on the tissue. And you also get this very basic unsupervised clustering result. And I think this can be it can serve as a quality check just to see that, uh, check if the clusters reflect the tissue heterogeneity and to check if you actually capture a lot of transcripts where you expect. Uh, okay, so then let's move on to data analysis. I would like to talk a little bit about this desktop application called the Loop Browser. So this is a tool from 10x. I think this is a super useful tool and it's very easy to get started with and very intuitive. So here you can, you can uh, for example, explore uh, clusters using unsupervised clustering. You can run differential expression analysis. So here, for example, you can see uh, uh, marker genes for each cluster. Uh, but you can also use the tissue uh, histology to guide selections of spots in regions that you are particularly interested in. So here, for example, I have highlighted a region that contains an immune infiltrate. And then you can just press a button and it will run a differential expression test for you. And you will get a list of genes that are upregulated in your selection compared to the rest of the tissue. So this can be super useful if you just, if you know exactly what you're looking for, you just highlight it and you will get a list of marker genes for that region. And of course, you can also explore gene expression on the tissue. You just type in the name of the gene that you're interested in and it will show up as an, a, a sort of colored expression heat map. Uh, and you can also look at the, distribution of your gene of interest within each uh, cluster or selected region. And then this tool also makes it super easy to zoom in on smaller features of the tissue. So here I have just, uh, this is an example of uh, where I have selected a marker gene for enteric neurons in the small intestine. And what you're looking at here is a sort of aggregate of neurons and you can see that the gene is upregulated in this region and this is a 
maybe just a few hundred microns wide. Okay, so the loop browser is a, an excellent tool. I really I think it's uh, very intuitive and especially for those who don't have so much uh, programming experience. Uh, but then of course, if you have a lot more freedom, if you know how to work, work in, for example, R and Python, there are already a bunch of different tools that you can use to run VSIM data analysis. For example, uh, Surat, which is very popular for single cell data analysis. There, you can also use STUtility from our lab. And for Python users, there was recently a release of a, a module called SquidPy. Uh, and with these tools, you can basically do exactly the th same things that I showed you in the loop browser, such as unsupervised clustering, differential expression analysis, marker detection. Uh, but then you, of course, also have the freedom to implement your own ideas. And uh, you can also do things like uh, cell type mapping, which I will talk about in a few minutes. Okay, so just to give you an idea of what you can do with these tools. Here, for example, I started with four tissue sections. And so you have the age and images and the corresponding expression matrix. Uh, and then you can load it into these tools and process everything together. And then you can of course, visualize marker genes of interest. You can do unsupervised clustering. You can do things like uh, dimensionality reduction. And of course, you can also uh, run differential expression analysis. So a lot of the things that you can do for single cell RNA-seq analysis, you can also do for visual analysis. Uh, but it's just important to keep in mind that you're looking at mixtures of cells now and not uh, single cells. Another thing that has been, there's been quite a lot of development on are these uh, methods to detect genes that have a high spatial autocorrelation. Uh, so these are essentially genes with a, maybe you could say a spatially coherent structure in the tissue. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of different tools for this. Uh, one from our lab is called CEPAL. It was developed by Alma Andersson. She's a really talented computational biologist. And I think it's a, it's a really nice tool if you want to explore this. These tools can be particularly useful if you want to um, find marker genes in your tissue and maybe uh, characterize the tissue entirely based on, the, on molecular data. Uh, and I think this is maybe one of the most interesting types of analysis uh, that we call cell type mapping. Um, there are a couple of methods for this as well. From our lab, we have stereoscope. This was also developed by Alma Andersson. And what you need to run this tool is a single cell RNA-seq data set, and of course the vision data. And then what this tool can do, do for you is to map out where in the tissue the cells are located. And you can also quantify uh, the proportion of cells within each spot. And just to show an example, here I ran this type of analysis on this small intestine section. And I used a data set containing immune cells. And here you can clearly see the sort of compartmentalization in, within this uh, lymphoid tissue you can see where these different immune cells uh, are localized. Uh, here's another example where I had a lot more cells. Uh, and so I think it was about 13 different cell types and they had been collected from the intestinal epithelium. And then when I mapped them onto this small intestine, um, I could kind of group them into uh, like group cells by correlation. So cells that have, are localized in the same area will have a high correlation score. So it's a kind of easy way of finding uh, co-localized cell types. And when I did this, I could find maybe uh, four different groups in the intestinal epithelium. So at, 
at the top here you find enterocytes then you have more like um, amplifying cells beneath that you also have this intraepithelial lymphocytes and at the bottom you have uh, more stem cells and progenitor cells and then i would just like to show you this really cool method this was developed by uh, ludwig berg and strohle another phd student in our lab this is a method called xfuse and what it does is that it it uses deep learning to to combine the whole histological information from the HNE image with the gene expression data. And then it kind of learns how to predict gene expression directly from an HNE image. And what you get is what we call super resolved spatial transcriptomics. So now you can actually explore gene expression at the, the single cell resolution using this um, deep learning uh, strategy. Uh, and this uh, method is currently on by archive and it's being uh, uh, currently it's under revision. Okay, so that was a super brief overview of some different analysis that you can run. If you are interested, we have a website for our group called specialresearch.org and here you can find all the latest uh, publications from our group. And with that, I would just like to acknowledge our research group. This is the genomics research team. And then I will hand over the word to Remy. Yes, hello. Um... So yeah, um, I will just talk a little bit about what uh, uh, the NGI platform can provide in terms of analysis uh, for uh, uh, spatial transcriptomics. Um, oops, yeah. So uh, first I will start to just describe a few features or maybe traits you can call them about the analysis that we provide uh, at NGI. Um, uh, and yeah, first, uh, we re try to use uh, stable and reproducible workflows. So a sort of a gold standard that I like to uh, talk about very often is a, a community-driven community project called NF Core, uh, which is a collection of uh, bioinformatics workflows. Um, and uh, these pipelines, they're, off, they're sort of um, ensured to be stable and re reproducible by using strict version control. Uh, they uh, free and open uh, code is mandatory, and you use uh, uh, you have to use uh, containers uh, and continuous testing. And and the, these pipelines are also very, very portable. So we use uh, at NGI. Uh, we have two. Uh, pipelines that we run routinely, uh, one for bulk RNA-seq uh, analysis, and the other, um, SAREC, is for uh, whole genome uh, sequencing samples. And of course, uh, we also run a few others uh, as well, um, and these are more on requests that we can run this. Um, and I will also talk about uh, non-NFCore uh, uh, workflows later uh, in this presentation. But uh, I, I encourage you to visit our uh, website, ngisweden.salaflab.se. There you can read more about uh, the, the uh, methods we can provide. So uh, another uh, trait is that uh, we have a very fast feedback uh, to and from the wet lab. So this might make this might point might seem obvious, uh, but it's sort of like um, it can um, give us um, you can spot problems early. So I, I like to give like a horror example, and this has not happened in real life. I hope uh, is that uh, we don't want to deliver data, and uh, maybe a few weeks later, a few months later, some poor student uh, uh, 
discovers that there is something wrong, God forbid. Uh, the, another uh, uh, sort of uh, feature is that uh, the analysis we provide uh, is that uh, they have to be, or they should be generali generalizable to a, a single sequence sample. Uh, so as sort of a, an example of that uh, for our bulk RNA uh, pipeline is that we can provide a, a gene feature count or gene counts uh, as shown in the image on the left, uh, but we do not provide uh, differential expression analysis, which sort of requires more input you know, uh, of uh, um, uh, replicates and so on. Right. Uh, so yes, onto Space Ranger. Um, so uh, we run the Space Ranger count pipeline. Uh, it takes as input um, the uh, um, uh, FOSQ files, and that has been uh, specially demultiplexed using BCL to FOSQ, uh, and the uh, microscope images. Um, so uh, Space Raider uh, count pipeline, it, it, uh, each run um, takes one uh, sequence sample, uh, sequencing sample and one capture area image. So it does uh, the uh, uh, image processing and uh, barcode UMI assignment. It does read mapping and uh, the gene expression analysis. Uh, I mean, primarily it supports uh, um, human and mouse, but uh, uh, please get in touch with, with us if if, uh, if you have other species. We can discuss that. So yes, uh, we deliver, uh, of course, the FOSQ files, and these are uh, FOSQ files that can be used directly with uh, Space Ranger. And the JPEG images and the results from uh, Space Ranger count this is this includes the uh, the uh, uh, loot file, uh, which uh, uh, Ludwig showed you can you can easily explore, start uh, getting started to explore your data, uh, and uh, a few other files uh, as well as a, a, a HTML report that also Ludwig showed you. So I will also show this here. Um, so this is just an example report I grabbed from the uh, uh, 10x website. Uh, it's uh, human cerebellum. Uh, so I will uh, just show you what we look at. Um, so first, the mean uh, reads per spot. Uh, I think Anneli mentioned that we would like to see this number above uh, 50,000. Uh, and also the median genes per spot. And a good uh, sort of uh, number there is above 2000. Uh, then uh, you also see here a, a picture of the, um, of the capture area overlaid with uh, the sort of um, uh, spots that the algorithm has called as uh, tissue or background, and also the alignment of this uh, uh, capture area. I mean, where <laughs> the algorithm thinks the spots are. And I will talk a little bit about that in the next slides. But uh, Ludwig also mentioned that um, uh, the uh, UMI count is also very uh, good place to look for like a sanity check and uh, of course we, we can we will look at that. Uh, so uh, this is uh, I'll just show this. Uh, so um, some in some cases the the uh, the image uh, algorithm will not uh, do a an accurate uh, job. Uh, so uh, I don't know if this can be seen on screen, but uh, the uh, red circles, uh, these are uh, where the uh, algorithm sort of 
placed the uh, what we call the fiducial marks, uh, which which are in the frame of the capture area, and below that you can see where they actually are in the microscope image. So I mean, this is just a constructed example. Uh, the algorithm probably did a much better job here in real life, but I just show you this for instructions. So what we can do at NGI, we can you know manually correct this, uh, and it's it's very easy actually to do in the loop browser. So I'll just show you this. You just drag and drop uh, the corners of this uh, this frame, and. You can, of course, do a more accurate job, uh, but this was done very quickly. Um, and after this, you also get the option to manually yourself paint in what you think is tissue and what you think is background. And of course, after this, uh, you have to run the Space Ranger count pipeline again. And, and we will do this. And yeah, uh, as I said, this is uh, if it's needed. Uh, it's very often the case that it's not needed to do this. Oops. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, finally, uh, our hope is that uh, the analysis that we provide, it will give you a good start in exploring your data. So, I mean, we can perhaps uh, point you in the correct direction for where to go from here. Um, and uh, uh, I think Ludwig gave you a very good overview of what other tools are out there to, to answer your research questions. Uh, but another right direction to point you in is uh, a uh, side of lab facility, NBIS. Uh, they can provide you with uh, uh, hours of um, uh, bioinformatics support to, for instance, run uh, to do the analysis for you. But they also have uh, uh, very low threshold, um, uh, low threshold services like uh, free consultation. Uh, and even before you send the samples to us, you can have a free consultation with them for like uh, uh, project design. And they also uh, have uh, bioinformatics drop-in hours, like if you have a tool that you are struggling to run and so on, that can be very, they are very helpful. And with that, that's all I really wanted to talk about. Yes, so so the next speaker is, is uh, James Shell, and he's a senior scientist at 10X uh, Genomics. And he has previously worked as a postdoctoral uh, researcher in uh, Jonas Frisian's lab. And he will give us an update on the uh, Visium spatial uh, platform. Thanks, uh, Michaela. So yeah, I'll, I'll just give, um, after that fantastic introduction by the speakers to uh, Visium uh, and what Visium offers today, um, I'll just give uh, a little introduction, a little flavor of what's coming next on the Visium spatial platform uh, that, that you can look forward to. Um, so just to start by, you know, mentioning, you know, Visium is one of three, um, three, you know, very, uh, now three very powerful platforms that 10X offers. So, you know, the single cell uh, powerhouse uh, where, where 10X made his name, uh, where we're, we're really leaders, uh, you know, constantly innovating. And I think uh, you saw today uh, the power of combining single cell with the Visium platform. And then uh, the third platform uh, that we have now, um, which some of you will be aware um, after we uh, acquired uh, Recore and Cartana, uh, so Cartana, another uh, made in Sweden uh, company. So the in-situ platform is, is lower plexi, but it, it it's, doesn't need a, a sequencing output. It's, a, it's an image-based uh, readout. So that gives you, you know, when you know what you're looking for, a very focused, extremely high resolution assay to detect uh, your genes of interest. And, you know, these three platforms uh, sit very nicely together and really offer researchers uh, great choice uh, and, and power. So the Visium platform, I think, as uh, Michaela introduced uh, in the beginning, it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, a great year for spatial technologies in general uh, last year and Visium in particular. And, you know, just really um, 
what's been demonstrated, I think, is the power of when you bring the spatial element uh, and, and combine it fully and fully integrate it with, uh, you know, a whole transcriptome and other genomic proteomic data. Um, and, you know, you really can't get, you know, full understanding of, of your system, of your disease or developmental process without having that spatial element. So it really, you know, opens up new windows of, of, of discovery. Um, and here, you know, you can see the, the, the ever increasing uh, number of publications which are really taking off and, you know, we're really excited uh, to see this explosion of research being supported by the NGI. Um, so what I did want to draw your attention to, if, you know, you're interested in the technology, but, uh, you know, you still have lots of questions, uh, there are a wealth of resources um, on the 10x website, um, you know, demonstrated protocols, technical guides, uh, videos and some public data sets if you want to, you know, play around for yourself and, and see what this looks like. Um, so yeah, we have a real, um, I think it's the support for Visium is a real strength at 10x. So, you know, please uh, have a look uh, if you're interested there. And then um, do follow up directly if you have extra questions uh, with support at 10x. Um, to, so we can really make sure uh, you have uh, all the information you need to, to understand and move forward. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about today, which is a project I'm uh, personally involved with, is FFP. So this was, um, uh, after Visium launched, probably the top customer request is, can we run Visium with uh, formaldehyde fixed paraffin embedded samples? So these are, you know, the standard uh, samples, the standard uh, method of preservation uh, for clinical samples. You know, this is... Uh, the majority of what ends up in biobanks, you know, so millions of samples a year, absolutely huge, huge numbers in biobanks that contain very valuable samples um, that, you know, we really want to be able to address with the Visium product. So previously, uh, Visium was uh, only compatible with these fresh, fresh frozen sections that you've heard about today. Um, so the problem with FFP is that during the process of fixing and embedding, um, you know, everything gets cross-linked, uh, you know, your RNA gets sequestered away, and it also leads during that process, and then over time, as the blocks are stored on the shelf uh, at room temperature, usually degradation of the RNA. And once the RNA uh, is degraded, it's very difficult to um, use in NGS assays. Um, so this was kind of the starting point for um, Visium uh, on FFP. Uh, so you see this is just a sensitivity curve with the genes versus uh, reads per spot. And you can see, you know, uh, the nice performance of the standard Visium assay there. And then if you just put a section uh, of FFP on a Visium slide, uh, you know, get rid of the wax and then run Visium, uh, you have, uh, I think what's very obvious is, is a not great performance. Um, but then last year, some really nice work, again, from the, the, the team at SciLife, from the Lindeberry Lab. Uh, so, you know, uh, with uh, Jonas Friesen's lab uh, at SciLife, the birthplace of the technology which became Visium, they actually demonstrated that um, with some protocol tweaks and, you know, uh, initiating decrosslinking to kind of get rid of this, uh, the crosslinks introduced by formaldehyde, you could actually uh, run FFP with uh, with F, with uh, standard Visium uh, and get, you know, extract biology from your samples, uh, which was pretty amazing. Um, but in-house at 10x, uh, we actually uh, went back to the beginning and, and, you know, asked how can we fully address FFP samples if we start from the ground up? Um, so I have to, you know, the timing of this is, is probably not great. So uh, we will actually very soon be launching this product and the entire workflow and a full description of the chemistry will be available to you very soon. Uh, I can't go into details today, but it will be with, it will be out there very, very soon. But um, what I can see is uh, the chemistry we developed does not rely on the poly A tails of the transcripts, uh, which is uh, how standard vision works as has been described, capturing by the poly A tail onto the poly T uh, um, oligonucleotides on the slide. Um, so we don't rely on the poly tail of the transcript. Uh, we do something uh, very different, which allows us to get around uh, some of the issues that you do experience when working with FFP. Um, and what we've, uh, what we've found is we can get comparable sensitivity to the Visium for fresh frozen assay from these FFP samples. And it's gonna be a very familiar on-slide workflow. Uh, so if you've ever done Visium, uh, yeah, 
there's going to be nothing scary. Um, it's going to be uh, very familiar. And the data is analyzed in exactly the same way in Space Ranger and in the Loop browser as, as have been uh, demonstrated today. Um, so there are some differences around the sectioning. Uh, Anna Lee introduced some of the issues around getting fresh frozen section. Um, FFP sections are a little bit different. You actually float them on a water bath and fish them out. So they have their own uh, you know, quirks and intricacies of getting the samples there. Um, but then, you know, it's a, a very standard on slide uh, workflow and then library prep uh, that we'll be offering. So this is uh, from uh, Mousebrain, uh, just somewhere we usually start as a comparison with uh, the new Visium for FP product, which will be la launching soon, uh, showing the, the clustering, uh, which is exactly as you would get from a fresh frozen section with the current uh, standard Visium product for fresh frozen. And you can see then if we map, uh, in this case, genes or UMIs by reads per spot, we start to uh, match that performance in, in these, uh, in these um, uh, relatively uh, high quality uh, FFP samples. Um, one other aspect that we wanted to improve is to make sure with these samples, you know, um, pathology is key. So these samples, it, it's a lot to do with translational research. These samples are, you know, all about the clinic. And part of that is, you know, integrating with pathologist annotations of the tissue. Um, so we have tweaked the h &E protocol. Uh, to allow uh, very good contrast uh, between the hemotoxin and the niacin and, you know, um, adjusted slightly the imaging guidelines, still all the same uh, microscopes should be uh, absolutely compatible, nothing to change there, but just change the guidelines slightly to make sure you take a uh, high quality, high resolution image with good contrast between the stains that will allow pathologists to to generate um, their annotations for you to use uh, and analyze your data with. And then just to show here in this breast cancer sample, um, we have the clusters uh, which are mapping to uh, the, the different morphological regions, which is your kind of sanity check as uh, Ludwig mentioned, and you know, map to uh, the annotations of the pathologists. And you know, just like with normal Visium, you can also find differences uh, within areas that carry the same annotation. Uh, just as an example for this sample, uh, here, this is, uh, uh, was uh, previously uh, with uh, IHC, shown to be a triple positive breast cancer. And if we look at HER2 and the progesterone and estrogen receptors, we see their distributions uh, at the single gene level. And you can see actually that they don't all share a one common expression pattern. And you can see differences between different regions of carcinoma. Um, one other aspect, which will, uh, just like with standard Visium, is we will... Uh, will release with compatibility with an immunofluorescence staining uh, rather than an h &E stain. And uh, you know, if you do that, then you can already have a kind of low-plex low plex protein co-detection and you know, have a, a, a little uh, sort of sprinkling of, of multi-ohm, uh, I guess you would say, uh, for the assay. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, and as has been shown here in the loop browser, so you'll interact with the data in exactly the same way um, you know, navigating by regions of interest and genes of interest, you know, from an experiment, you have these thousands and thousands of individual gene expression patterns, which you can select and combine and go back to at your will. So it, it's really, you know, the full power of Visium uh, remains intact uh, for FFP. Um, and just, uh, you know, usually this is done with, uh, I think, a fruit salad analogy, but um, the reason I'm introducing this slide about, you know, going from bulk to single cell to spatial um, is just, you know, that you've already seen really nice examples of combining uh, single cell data. Um, as an example from 10X Chromium with the Visium platform to get really, you know, a functional sense, you know, an understanding of what's happening in your tissue. And you'll be able to do exactly the same thing uh, with spatial FFP data. Um, so what I mean by that is if you already have um, cell signatures, gene expression signatures um, from single cell data, uh, you'll still be able to combine that um, and, you know, assign, assign your, your single cell values and, and, and understand where those cells uh, would be existing in your tissue, you know, so going beyond the resolution of current physium and applying the single cell data, mapping it onto your, onto your tissue of interest. So, uh, in this case, this is some data that was presented at AGBT by 10X. Um, 
we had a fresh frozen block and an FFP block from the same tumor. Uh, the fresh frozen block, um, we actually used, uh, we extracted uh, nuclei uh, and ran, uh, ran, ran those nuclei on the chromium platform uh, doing the three prime uh, expression assay. And then the FFP, we ran on FFP for Visium. And then we uh, combined that data uh, uh, to then map all those different clusters and cell types onto the tissue. And here is just one example uh, from that data set where you can see uh, the kind of later stages of B cell maturation from um, memory B cells to uh, plasma blasts to, to plasma cells and their different distributions uh, within the tissue, just, just to demonstrate that you can still do all the, all the things that you can do with the normal Visium assay, you can do with Visium for FFP. So um, as I said, this is coming very soon. Um, I know this is a, a technical crowd and I would have loved to share um, the chemistry scheme of how this works, how we've been able to, to do this for FFP and also a few more details of the workflow, uh, uh, you know, how much it's the same, uh, super straightforward and easy to work with, um, but also some of the key differences. Um, but that information will be out there very soon. For, so we're very excited about this product and it will be coming uh, in the next, uh, couple of months um, so yeah um, really high sensitivity in line with our our fresh frozen visium assay again whole transcriptome uh, again the whole tissue covered um, and you will be able to do if uh, in the first case uh, and yeah the the chemistry which will be uh, with you soon is non poly a based so we're doing something quite different with this product um, and then i just wanted to mention uh, some of our other development efforts, um, which will be uh, in this case coming quite soon. Uh, and then also uh, I'm gonna finish with something which will be coming next year. So uh, not something you, know, you should wait for if you want to run Visium now, but I think something that um, the field will be very excited about. But something that um, is under, under heavy development and uh, should be, there's gonna be a lot more information about this um, towards the end of this year, in the second half of this year, is having a truly, um, highly multiplex protein solution. Um, so this is on the same section. So on the same section, you'll run uh, the protein assay and the gene expression assay, gene expression assay to have true spatial multiomic readout. So this will allow you to quanti quantitatively measure, you know, dozens and dozens of proteins of interest um, and have that information and interact with it uh, in our software, you know, in combination with gene expression data from the, the same section. So we're really excited about that. And that's gonna be uh, available um, very soon this year. Um, so look out for that. Uh, another thing we get asked about a lot at 10X uh, is uh, the capture area. So um, I think, you know, it's, a, it's quite a sweet spot where we are right now at the 6.5 by 6.5 millimeters, but sometimes, you know, people just really want to run uh, larger pieces of tissue, you know, full biopsy uh, and, and get everything on there. And uh, what will be uh, arriving also, um, second half of this year, towards the end of this year, um, along with the uh, multi-ohm uh, solution will be these larger capture area slides. Um, so instead of the four standard areas, you'll have um, two large areas uh, of this time 11 by 11 millimeters uh, of active area. So that's almost three times the size of the standard area. Um, so for those, for those uh, researchers that really need uh, that, extra, that extra space, we will enable that. Um, and then I think finally, something that's slightly earlier in development, but is asked about so frequently, um, you know, it, it's what people really, are. Uh, many people really want to see is bringing that single cell resolution uh, onto the Visium platform. Uh, and we are going to be doing that uh, with our Visium HD product. Um, so there'll be more information coming up, out about this uh, next year. Um, and just to demonstrate the difference between Visium and Visium HD, you can see standard Visium uh, on the top row uh, in, of the HE there and the, the Visium spot of 55 microns. And then if you go to the image below, you can see the, the Visium HD spot of around four microns. And then on the right-hand side in the, in the, uh, the fluorescent image, uh, you can see those um, four micron HD features uh, 
uh, you know, patterned over a standard Visium spot of 55 microns. So you'll be able to, you know, really have uh, that higher resolution. Um, if, if, if that's something you need in your experiments, we'll be able to offer that to you. Um, so yeah, that's slightly lot. That's a, a slightly earlier in development than the Excel slides and the, and the multio. Um, so that's something um, you'll hear more about um, during uh, 2022. Uh, but uh, this year, um, you should be uh, able to uh, start to to get a lot more information uh, about Excel slides and and multi ohm solution. And yes, in the very near future, uh, FFP. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'd just like to, to thank you uh, for, for listening and, and thank uh, uh, Michaela and the NGI and Scilab teams for inviting me uh, to, to come and uh, talk a little bit about this and the whole uh, 10X team uh, in uh, Pleasanton and Stockholm. Uh, thank you. Thank you, James very exciting updates that are coming with the 10x uh, from 10x uh, genomics and i think we are all eager to see the ffp protocol or at least what i can see from from the chat right now um, so uh, with that i think that we can start our q a session Oh, just a moment. So I can see already now that it has been uh, quite some activity in the Q&A chat and uh, a lot of questions have already been answered. And there has been a lot of questions to Anneli in particular. Um, so you can still send in questions in the Q&A chat. Um, and you can also, if you would like, or if you prefer to um, ask it in person, you can just use the raise your hand button and we will unmute you. Um, I think that we can start with some of the questions that we got here after James presentation. So we have one interesting question here. Um, from uh, Gregory about what is the link between FFP block time, um, like time of the embedding and the Visium data quality, have that been tested before? Um, so I think embedding can can influence uh, how, you know, how your sample behaves. So I think, um, yeah, a few things. So there's block, block age, I guess, rather than the actual embedding protocol. So I think really, um, Obviously, in the end, super old samples uh, are more degraded, but really it's about the level of RNA fragmentation uh, is the key, not necessarily the age. So certainly, uh, you know, you can, we've found samples five years old, 10 years old um, that work really well, um, but equally you can find younger samples that work less well because they're more degraded. And that could come from, um, you know, ischemia time after a section, um, if, if it's a sample that you're trying to get from post-mortem, what's the interval time there? And then, you know, um, if it wasn't, I think these days, the process of fixation embedding is much more um, regular because people know, uh, you know, that uh, many are interested in the RNA and they need to be a bit more careful than for the protein. Um, however, you know, many samples uh, have been fixed embedded not too carefully and therefore the RNA will be more degraded. So uh, you can go quite old with this assay, but really it's about um, was the RNA um, preserved, was the, was the tissue treated well before it became, uh, you know, the final block. Thanks. So there have also been a lot of questions that has sent, been sent in during uh, the registration. Uh, so I will take some of those questions as well. So I have one question for um, Ludwig and Remy about uh, how much sequencing that is needed and how the saturation should be interpreted that you, that you get uh, together with your Space Ranger report. Um, okay, so I would say that uh, 
Uh, like you mentioned, I think, or maybe it was only that uh, 10X recommends that you have 50,000 reads per spot covered on tissue. So I guess that can give you an idea of how much you need to sequence. Uh, but then when it comes to saturation, yeah, I think that uh, uh, in this, if you run a VSIM experiment and in this summary report, it will, you will have like a reference level that you might want to tar target. So you can't reach 100% saturation, but you maybe you want to be close to 90% and that should be enough. Great. Um, so I will take another question here from the Q&A chat. Um, and here is one that I, I guess is for, for James more. Um, so have there been any developments on spatial epigenomics? Um, that's a great question. Um, so um, it's something um, we understand uh, there's quite an interest in. Um, obviously, the combination of, you know, uh, that space with protein and gene expression, as we've seen in the single cell products, um, would be extremely powerful. Um, so, you know, that's definitely something um, we're looking at. But um, uh, yeah, there's, uh, that would be, um, yeah, I can't speak to, to the exact uh, development stages or, or, but yeah, it's something we're very aware of and would be very powerful. Um, so yeah, it's something, yeah, to, sorry to be a bit vague, but uh, yes. Okay, so another question for, for Anneli. Um, so you touched upon this in your presentation, but I think it's, it's good to go through this um, again. So, um, so how, how do, when you send in, or when you want to send in samples, how do you uh, freeze your samples and embed them in OCT? And, and why is froze fresh, uh, froze fresh tissue in, important for the Visium platform? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Uh, well, as uh, James talked about, uh, uh, FFP material is not uh, uh, compatible yet with, uh, with the Visium method. Hence, uh, we have to use uh, fresh frozen material to get out uh, good data. Uh, and uh, the freezing procedure, uh, there are several ways how to do it. Uh, one way is to, um, after dissection, you put your sample in uh, cold OCT in a mold, and then you immerse it in cold isopentane. And the isopentane can be um, cooled down by uh, liquid nitrogen or with um, a slurry of ethanol and uh, uh, dry ice together. So you have a bowl in a bowl, so to speak. Uh, this is very uh, nicely um, uh, demonstrated in the user guides that you can find on Tenex website. Uh, another way is to, after dissection, uh, freeze down your samples directly in uh, cold isopentane and uh, put it in a tube or, or something uh, for storage in the minus 80 freezer, and then you embed it cold in uh, within the cryostat. But so, so both works. Uh, but to my experience, I think it's best to do uh, the embedding and freezing at the same time. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, just uh, send in a follow-up question in the Q&A chat or contact Anneli immediately or anyone else as, as at the NDI. Um, so another question that... Um, yeah, many has asked is uh, how many cells that are captured within uh, a spot. And I think that if we have a 10x representative ask, <laughs> um, rep um, answering this question, the, the answer will be maybe one between one and 10 uh, cells. But I think it would be nice to hear maybe Alice answer to this, um, who has uh, um, who has like another point of view, like for your tissue type, for example, how many cells do you see per spot? 
Yeah, so it depends a little bit on the layer within the skin, but I would say that that estimate is pretty accurate, actually. Um, there sometimes are a little bit more, um, so maybe a little bit more than 10, but I would say that the, we're probably around the same. Um, Do you, Anneli, uh, see any differences in between different tissue types? You have seen a lot of uh, different tissue types. So. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, liver cells, uh, hepatocytes, they are super big. So uh, there you cannot um, fit in 10 cells uh, per spot. Uh, whereas immune cells uh, and infiltrates, I mean, they can be really, really small. So you can get, well, up to 10, I would say, per spot, or maybe even more. I haven't been calculating that because since I'm not working directly with uh, uh, with the uh, analysis, maybe Ludde or me has something to add here. Yeah, I, I can just like before they adding um, some answer to that. Also, because uh, we have a question in the chat that asks, um, so what should be the minimum number of cells per spot then to get good data? So do you have any, any view or idea about this? Was the question to Ludde? Yes. Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't understand that. Yeah, do you want me to repeat the question? Uh, no, no, I, I heard. Uh, that's really hard to say, like how many cells you need to get good data. But all I can say that it is that uh, yeah, the number of cells um, will, of course, affect how much data you get in the spot. But then maybe a, a cancer cell, it's much bigger and it maybe has a higher RNA activity. So you could maybe get a decent data from one cancer cell, but maybe not from one fibroblast. I think it depends a lot on the cell type in question. But just to comment on the, on the numbers of cells per spot, I think it's a pretty fair estimate, one to 10 cells. Sometimes you have higher numbers, but I think in general, that kind of, it's kind of what you see. Great, we have a, um, a question here about um, the, the spots again and uh, how far away they are um, in the, on the Visium uh, HD. James. Yes, um, sorry. So I think uh, the, the spacing would be, um, I, th I think it's a five micron pitch, as they say. So I guess the spacing is, so it can be half to one micron in between the spots. Um, yeah, um, so there's not a lot of dead space on those arrays. Uh, they're very densely packed. Um, so yeah, you're really, yeah, tiling everything. Um, the, the, there's not lots of, of, uh, of, of space left unanalyzed uh, there. It's very densely packed. Great. So another question that we have, um, which I think is, is very important to stress again, even if Anneli uh, brought it up also in her presentation, is um, before you submit your samples to NGI, um, what should you think about and what is required? Anneli. Yes. Um, the sampling, I would say. Uh, the sampling is uh, everything. Uh, but I know that many of you guys uh, are working with patient material uh, where you cannot control the, the sampling and collection. And so, so there are samples that lays on the bench for a couple of hours before you get it. If you have the chance uh, to talk to the surgeon, you may be going there and take care of your piece directly. Uh, if not, you cannot expect very high RIN value. However, it, if you have precious samples um, and you still want to analyze it with Visium and the RIN value is lower, we can always discuss it. But you have to know then that the data will not be as good. Um, what was the question again, Michaela? So it was like, what, what to think about before submitting your samples? So 
I think we can also mention um, the type of uh, quality control that you need to check yourself also before you send in your samples to us. Yeah, and the, the quality that we want you to check, uh, the quality things is uh, the ring value. Uh, you extract the RNA. You can section a few uh, sections, like five or so, 10 microns from your sample. Put it in a tube, uh, extract the RNA, and run it on a bioanalyzer or similar. Um, there are other techniques to do that. I think we use a bioanalyzer uh, to check for the RNA integrity and get a RIN value. And then it's always uh, a good idea to uh, take a couple of uh, sections, stain it with uh, hematoxylin and neosin, and have a look at it in the microscope to see that. Uh, the integrity is good, you don't have any good uh, large cracks or so, and if you feel unsure about this, you can send your samples to us, you discuss it with us, we, we take a look and we can see if we, we think that it's uh, good enough. Uh, we can uh, admit some cracks, that, that's okay, but uh, if the freezing procedure have been um, not so good, then, you can, uh, that, then it can be ruined, actually. Uh, so, but we will have user meetings with you and we will discuss these in detail. Yes. Yeah. Does that answer the, that question? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, so you also mentioned before um, the type of tissue that we support and that 10X has a list of supported um, uh, tissues. We, um, uh, we do take on uh, tissues that are not supported by 10X, and, and, but we, do, we will have a discussion with the, the users beforehand. Um, however, uh, as you mentioned, we do not take on plant tissue at the moment. Uh, and uh, there has been a question about bone tissue also here, if we support that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't. Bone tissue seems not to work at all. I don't know if James have anything to say about this, if they have tried it at 10X, but I have tried cartilage uh, a couple of years back and it doesn't seem to, to be compatible with this method. We cannot um, uh, get out the mRNA as we want to and bones won't adhere to the, to the surface. It, will, it doesn't work. What do you say, James? Um, so, I mean, for I know there have been efforts uh, within Visium uh, to, to work with bone, uh, so I would actually direct people to uh, 10x support for that question, but I know in general one thing uh, about the bone is very often to section it, you have to decalcify it, and that decalcification can either be short and harsh or, you know, sort of uh, milder, but then it takes quite a long time, uh, and often that has, you know, knock-on effects for your RNA. Um, so that's part of the reason it's a big challenge. Um, but yeah, I would, I would direct people to uh, 10x support and they might have some further information on where things stand with bone. Uh, when we talk about sectioning, I, I, I would like to, if there is time, I would like to mention something that I forgot in my presentation and that has to do with the sectioning uh, with your samples, with user samples, that some of you, uh, some of the users will have a specific, super specific spot in their sample that that we cannot judge, so to speak. So what we have we have uh, solved it then by having the user uh, beside when I do the sectioning, so uh, we can work together there and get the exact sweet area that you want. During the pandemic, however, <laughs> this is a challenge. Uh, so. Um, uh, Michaela, you can talk about uh, the sending out of the, mm -hmm. the, the glass slides, the array. Yes, so, so at the moment during the pandemic, since we have some requirements in our lab to have uh, external researchers here visiting, uh, we do offer, if you would like, um, to have the, the glass slides sent to you and you do the sectioning and you send the glass slides uh, with the 
tissue sections, uh, sections uh, back to us and we perform uh, the library prep and the sequencing. Um, so this is good to know for, for you um, if, if that is um, an option for you. Yes, so I think um, we are uh, getting closer to, to, to lunch, but um, I think we can have uh, one more question. I think that all the questions in the Q&A chat has been answered. Um, but I have one more questions that have been sent in, and that is if we are able with the 10x Visium uh, platform to detect viral genes or bacterial genes. So anyone? Um, not something I've been working on with the current Visium product, of course, which relies on having the poly A, but I don't know if in SciLife uh, there's been uh, some fun hacks of that to enable things. Uh, but uh... I can say that uh, there is a PhD student in our group who has been uh, looking at uh, bacterial uh, RNA in the plants, and that seems to work. But then he has, uh, I guess, applied a few tricks. I'm not entirely sure. So, so with the, with, if you run the current version, you will not be able to run these particular, um, to detect these particular genes. I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, I don't know if viral transcripts can be polyadenylated, but mm. I guess uh, bacterial transcripts uh, are mm. not possible to catch. Good, so, so, so basically you will detect all the old RNA that has a poly A tail in your sample. All right, so I think that we can end the session. And before we end the session, I would just like to thank all the attendants here today. We have been almost 120 at some points. And um, I also would like to give a big thanks to all our amazing speakers today. And um, we hope to see you soon again at our next event uh, on the Novo um, analysis, uh, the 26th of May. So you can register at the SciLife Lab website under events. And uh, if you haven't had enough of spatial transcriptomics and Exvisium, um, please also register for their online symposium, um, the 4th of May. Please also send us feedback on today's session and in particular on what uh, you would like to hear or know more about from us at NDI. So with that, I would like to say have a great day to all of you um, and goodbye. Thanks, Kayla. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.